was enough to mercy endures forever. Good morning. There is a word from the Lord. And if you would journey with me to a very familiar passage, it is found in Psalm 23, verses 1 through 6. Psalm 23, verses 1 through 6. Amen. And it reads as follows. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Verse 5 says, Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, so much so that my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Thus ends the reading. You may be seated. If I could just talk to you for a little while from the title, The Lord Is. Let us pray. O God, my Heavenly Father, I come to you, O Lord, just lifting up your name. Father, I ask that on this day, today, dear Lord God, that you meet someone where they're at, someone who has come in today and needs to hear a word from you. And so, oh, Father, I ask that I decrease and that the Holy Spirit that resides in me increases and that the words that fall off my lips, that it touches the heart of someone that is here and that they know that you exist, that they know that you love them and that you've got them, oh God. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the way that you love us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for the way that you bless us. And oh God, today we're going to lift your name up in praise. It is in your Son, Jesus' name, that we pray. Amen. 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 It seems that lately I have been in a tug of war in my thoughts with my life, my purpose, my destiny, and my path. I've been trying to function in many roles and with many hats. It seems as if I have 5,000 things to do and I am running around like a chicken with my head cut off, trying to fulfill one task after another pulled at from all sides and trying to show up in each realm the best that I can. Like a hamster in a wheel, I am moving but getting nowhere fast. 
just continuing the cycle of trying to get it all done, but having zero satisfaction in any of the results, if I am even getting any results at all. So I decided I needed a respite from the whirlwind of doing, doing, and doing. And so I went on a vacation this past week that was meant to relax and rejuvenate in a plan of self-care and enjoyment of the things that I like to do. Instead, things didn't go according to plan, and I was left to my thoughts that continually bounced around in my head. Nothing seemed to be working out the way I had expected. It seemed as if every time I took one step forward, life kept knocking me two steps back. When would it be my turn to have some success I so desperately wanted? When would the Lord open doors for me that seemed incessantly closed? Where was my breakthrough? I wanted to know, Lord, do you hear me? It seemed as if my pleas and my questions fell upon deaf ears, and so I accused the Lord of not even being there. No way he even loved me because after all, it didn't appear he was giving me my way, which much less present to my beckoning. I returned from vacation with no further rest. In fact, I had many sleepless nights. My flight home was late in the evening, and the trickle effect began with this hour delay over luggage en route. <laughs> really, Lord? <laughs> when, when, you, when we finally took off, we were informed of the extraordinary windy conditions and the turbulence we would endure. <laughs> Lord, are you serious right now? <laughs> Finally, we landed with my life still intact. I retrieved my luggage and stood in the cold on the curb, but the courtesy van to my parking destination seemed to be wayward in their picking up schedule. Anxiety is functioning on high octane 10. Half an hour later, I am approaching my car. I thought it odd when I hit the remote locks that the car didn't respond nor light up. Surely the key fob needed new batteries. It was cold and roughly 1230 in the morning. My brain wasn't computing the obvious and thought the car simply needed to be manually unlocked. The van had disappeared as quickly as it had dropped me off. And it was to my dismay that once I opened the door, still nothing lit up. In my stupidity, I am still holding out hope, and I put the key in the ignition, and you guessed it, nothing happened. <laughs> Not even a click. DEF CON meltdown began. The car was dead, and I was defeated. I thought of all the ways this was my husband's fault, even though he wasn't even with me. After all, it was he that had me take his car because it was smaller and more fuel efficient. Had I been in my own vehicle, I would not have left the interior light on in my rush to catch the courtesy van upon my arrival. I wouldn't have been late and out of sorts in this different environment. Had I had the familiarity of my own vehicle in my rush, I would have remembered to turn off the light. But no, he had me sitting in this mess and caught in this predicament. It was also the Lord's fault. In addition to that husband of mine, because he did not care and he did not love me. He wasn't listening and he wasn't present. Nothing ever went my way. Never, ever, ever. I had many more tantrums and record breakdowns as the drama continued to unfold from a little old and slow guy showing up in this little tiny car. And I felt like I was on the show called Punked as I wondered what was he going to do with that little pea shooter. The answer was nothing at all. Grandpa, who worked for the hotel, proceeded to try to jump my extra dead vehicle with a little portable power pack, which set the alarm off repeatedly. I'm fussing 
and yes, I'm cussing, with my uh, faulted husband as he is trying to tell me what to tell pops to do. I know this old guy isn't about to do any of those things, so I watched in hopelessness as he got back in his car and left me there in the night. I am informed that roadside rescue will be unable to get to me for two hours. Hotels are having no availability. I was stranded alone in the dark parking lot. Hotel attendants sympathetic to my plight, but not helpful at all. I wanted to know why, Lord, why? An Uber ride later, I arrived to a hotel my husband had secured for me, only to be told the reservation wasn't showing in the computer. I am functioning in deprivation. It is still my husband's fault, and the Lord still doesn't love me. They see the look on my face and immediately go into comfort mode and magically get my reservation to appear. I get a room that looks like I'm in a dilapidated Motel 6. When I thought I was at the Marriott, it smelled of cigarettes and mildew, but I resigned myself to, of course, this is my room, and this is what it looks like, because why? You got it, the Lord doesn't care. I stomped my feet and hurled more accusations at the Lord. I was outdone, I was finished, and then I heard him say, let go, be still, and know that I am God. He reminded me he would go before me and make the crooked ways straight. He said, according to John 10 and 27, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I sat still because I knew that God was there. I received a call from the husband at fault to tell me I was in the wrong room. Even though it was one in the morning, he had gotten me a king-size junior suite on the seventh floor because he wanted me to rest well until he could get to me the next day. This man was the love of my life. <laughs> My room was in the north tower of the hotel, which was night and day from the rat trap I was originally in. The bar that was closed in the hotel opened simply to feed me, and they gave me a 2 p.m. checkout so I could get some much needed rest. Amen. Amen. In my time of need, despite my unfair anger at my husband and my rejection of the Lord, the Lord showed up and proved to be my protector. He came and he was my provider. He moved and he was my way maker. He touched me and was my comforter. He soothed me and was my peace giver. Why? Simply because the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters, and he restores my soul. The Lord is and ever will be the one to provide all that I need. We find in this 23rd Psalm, David has written a sacred poem describing his very relationship with the Lord. It is not known exactly when David wrote it, but many believe it to have been while he reigned as king himself. As a young lad, having tended sheep, he knew the effort and care that went into being the shepherd. And he could relate in his times of need and necessity, the necessity of such care and attention that goes to the flock. He declared that he himself was like none other than the sheep and the Lord indeed the, uh, that the Lord indeed was the shepherd. Uh, throughout his life, David had some ups and downs, some ins and outs, and some triumphs and some letdowns. He had some victories and defeats, yet he had come to fully recognize, despite it all, and in spite of it all, he would want for nothing the Lord couldn't provide. He understood the relationship of the sheep and the shepherd. He knew the need of having a shepherd ever present because sheep often get lost without a guide. Sheep will wander and stray and get off the beaten path and it is the shepherd that will seek them out and bring them back to the flock. 
this is found to be true in John 10 and 11, when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd gives his life for the sheep. And yet we have trouble if we do not establish ourselves as sheep and position the Lord as the shepherd. Instead, we try to shepherd ourselves because we want to control the situation. We want to have both hands on the wheel, convinced we know our destination. Even when we try to let go, we will put our little pinky finger back on it to try to steer it in the direction we want to take our path because we feel the Lord just doesn't have it together. However, when we acknowledge that we are hindering ourselves and we accept the Lord as the good shepherd, it is then we will glean the promises of we shall not want. For it is the shepherd that uses wisdom when we lack knowledge. It is the shepherd that has strength when we are weak. It is the shepherd that gives kindness and provides a place of rest when we are weary. The shepherd trusts, the sheep trust and need the shepherd. And so it is with someone that loves us, wants us, is passionate about us, that the Lord as our shepherd understands the need and he knows what is best for us. Therefore, in his ever-loving care, when he makes us to lie down in green pastures, he understands when we need rest. He understands when we need comfort. He understands when we need time out from all of the things around us. And he grants us a spot that is serene and peaceful so our thoughts will not be distracted and our repose will not be interrupted. He will lead you by the still waters so that he may restore your soul and lead you in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. I want you to know, Second Baptist, that that all sounds kosher and dreamy and good. But what you have to know is even though the Lord is your shepherd and he is leading you beside still waters and you are lying in some green pastures, it doesn't mean you aren't going to encounter some valleys. We want the fact that we are following the Lord and that we have committed our lives to Christ to mean we are waking up every day smelling the roses and tipping through the tulips. But in reality, there is going to be some valleys with your name on it. You might as well go on and have a conniption fit just like I did. A few temper tantrums and some mass meltdowns. But when you get finished, you will have to recognize and face the fact the valley is still there and it is yours to endure. Some, some, some will try to turn from the valley. Others will try to deny the valley. And many will try to delay the valley. But those of us that hope in Christ will remember Psalm 37. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his ways. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. We still hold fast to his promise and know that if the Lord brings you to it, then he is capable of bringing you through it. You see, valleys will make you rely on that faith that we always talk about and wave our hands about when the preacher show is preaching. But when you are faced with your valley experience and you no longer have control of the situation and you have to activate that faith that always looks so good on paper or sounds good in the heroic Bible stories, well, I've come to tell you that is an entirely different mountain to climb. Hebrews 11 and 1 tells us, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. You see, faith is a hope for something we have not yet received. We are believing in it, but we don't yet have that which we are believing for. It is a confidence, a belief, a trust that what has not happened will happen. We don't really know the outcome, but we are believing for it favorably. It can be a slippery slope for those that like to be in control. And yet, without faith, it tells us that it is impossible to please the Lord. 
So I am taking hold of my faith, and I'm going to make it an action in the act of trust, and I'm going to go through the valley. Many cannot handle a valley experience and cannot believe the Lord would bring you to such. Many abort ship and lose their mind over any trial and tribulation. But there are others that take the attitude of Psalm 28. The Lord is my strength and my shield. In him my heart does trust and I am helped. When we lean on the Lord and we are walking through the valley of the shadow of death, and while the valley, while and while in that valley, there are some things we are going to do. The first thing we notice is we're going to walk. When we are walking rather than running, we can see some things. Anytime you're in a valley, especially one that represents the shadow of death, I know I wouldn't feel comfortable or safe, and I would not want to tarry there. When you are in a valley experience and it feels as if obstacles and mishaps are lurking in every corner, I can imagine one would have the tendency to want to run. You want to get through quickly and think about it once you are on the other side in the sanctity and comfort of what you feel is safe. But I want you to know when you run, too many mistakes can be made. When you run, often you are moving with no real direction and so haphazardly that you have no idea where it is that you are running to. When you run, you are moving too fast and likely to trip and fall over the obstacles that are before you, but that you weren't even aware that was there. When you run, you are missing what's in the valley because often if you are there, then there are some lessons to learn. So you walk, you walk, you walk to glean those nuggets which God has specifically for you. And if you are walking, then we know you are still having forward progress. You are making it somewhere. And often in that forward progress, you are going to have to leave some things and some folks behind. Some that had no business being with you, no way. And that can't get with the progression you are making. As a matter of fact, they are weighing you down and taking your eyes off the shepherd because you must keep moving and they are hindering your advancement. After a while, you're going to have to shake them loose because you have some concentrating to do. You have some places to go. You can't have anyone messing with your mind when you are in the valley. Tell them, I'm sorry, but you can't take up residence here and you're not paying any bills. You are going to have to render them homeless because you see, often they have some things that they need to learn themselves some valleys they need to endure on their own, but they can't because they are too busy piggybacking off of you while you trudge through your own trials and tribulations. Let them know I am walking with the Lord. I am in the valley, but I'm still serving the Lord. I am in the valley, but I'm still trusting in the Lord. I'm in the valley, but I have hope in the Lord. Because why? The Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd. Secondly, we know that we are going to go through the valley. That means we are not going to remain in the valley indefinitely but rather we are crossing to the other side. When we say we are going through, it means we are not stagnant and while the progress may not be pretty, we are going somewhere. We aren't going to stay where we are at. We are still in the forward progress of walking, but at least we're moving. Understand that yea though I walk through is a preposition and that is putting you in preposition. 
You are about to get in precious position to possess what God has for you. As long as you follow him and believe that he is. Don't throw in the towel and don't turn the other way. Don't deviate and get off course. Lean on Proverbs 3 and trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding, but in all your ways you should trust in him and he will direct your path. Third, the text tells us that while we are going through, we aren't going to fear. Fear will cause you to freeze in position. Fear will mess with your mind. Fear will stop you from doing that which you ought. Fear will cause you not to hear what you are supposed to hear. Fear will make your knees knock and your heart palpitate. Fear will have you believing lies. Fear will cancel out faith. Fear and faith don't coincide. For we walk by faith and not by sight. My sight will have me seeing things that will make me want to change my mind. My sight will make me want to turn around. My sight can cause me to want to quit. My sight will cause me to think I'm not going to make it. But my faith, my faith, my faith says I can do all things through Christ whom strengthens me. My faith reminds me that the Lord is and that Isaiah says fear not for I am with you be not dismayed dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you yes I will help you I will uphold you with my righteous hands I will not fear why because I have some resources the Lord is with me I'm not in this thing unequipped I've got some tools I can access I may be in the valley, but I'm going to go through it. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. When dangers come my way, it is he that provides. And when I get through the valley, there is going to be a table that is prepared in the presence of my enemies. Some goodness is about to come for me, for my head is anointed with oil and my cup, my cup, my cup, it runneth over. And because we have already established that the Lord is my shepherd, I know that surely, 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 that's an assurance, surely, that means without a doubt, surely, it means I've got some confidence Everything is going to be all right. Surely, 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 goodness and mercy will follow me, will follow me, will follow me, will follow me. Oh, all the days of my life, I know a man and his name is Jesus. I know a man and his name is Jesus. He is my redeemer. He is my comforter. Somebody told me he's like Pringles. Once you pop, you can't stop. My Jesus, he's like milk. He does the body good. My Jesus is like Maxwell House. He's good. He's good. He's good to the very last drop. I know that he's like Nike. Won't he do it? Won't he do it? Won't he do it? He's like AT&T. The existing Christians and the new Christians get the same deal. You get peace. You get peace. You get peace. You get peace. You get joy. You get joy! You get joy!
Well, praise God. Can't nobody do you like the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The doors of the church are open. We extend an invitation at this time. If there's anyone in the building who is seeking fellowship within a community of believers, we invite you to come and be a part of what God is doing in this season right here on this corner at 4th and Broadway. We are ready to receive you with open arms. But as I so often say, we would love to have you fellowship and become a part of our family here. But it's more important for you to know that you are in the family of God. And so regardless of where you decide to put down roots, I just want to see lives changed. I want to see lives transformed. I want to see people who are sold out for God, who are willing to surrender their past, their present, and their future. So that if you came in today carrying a burden, I have some good news for you. You don't have to carry that burden out of this building today because the Lord is, the Lord is, the Lord is, the Lord is. You can fill in the blank for yourself, but the Lord is everything that you need. So once you come, the altar is open. Take the step of faith and just walk to the front of the church. Allow our ministers to intercede in your behalf. We serve God who is still in the prayer answering business. And we want to make it user friendly. They're standing by so that even if you don't want to walk or you're not able to walk, to the front of the church, if you just raise your hand all over the sanctuary, we will come where you are and just pray with you because God has something extraordinary that he wants to manifest in your life. And all he asks is that you acknowledge that you need him, that you need him to be your shepherd. You need him. God bless you, brother. God bless you, brother. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you, Rev. Reverend Hill is coming at this time. Amen. God bless you. Yes, yes. The Lord is. Oh, yes, he is. Whatever you need, the Lord is. 